Hello, everyone. Hi. How's it going, guys? Great. Awesome. All right. So we're going to get started. Uh, this session is... Uh, it's a panel, panel presentation, Innovative Approaches to, uh, of Combination Prevention in the Age of a Pre-Exposure uh, pre Prophylaxis. Pre sorry, I can't even say this. Prophylaxis <laughs> Prep. Um, we have a number of presen presenters today. So, um, <clears throat> Kiffer needs to head to the airport after his presentation. So, what we're going to do is after his presentation, he's going to take questions. And after, we're going to have uh, three presentations, and we'll just save the uh, questions at the end. To the end. Is that okay? Great. So let me just load your. So I'm going to introduce Dr. Kiffer Card. Uh, he's a social epidemiologist and a postdoc fellow <clears throat> with these. Uh, sorry, came up. With the School of uh, School of Public Health and Social Policy at the University of Victoria, and a recipient of the Canadian Institute of Health Research Health System Impact. Impact Fellow, the M MS MSF FHR Trainee Award, and the CTN Postdoctoral Fellowship Award. He's an affiliate researcher at the Canadian Institute of Substance Use Research, the British Columbia uh, British Columbia Center for Excellence in HIV and AIDS, and the Community Based Research Center for Gay Men's Health. Okay. Oh, no, that's still not mine. Well, I'm surprised you all came to the prep session. I felt like it was a little bit traumatizing after last year's uh, whole entire summit being about prep. Um, and so, but it's good. I'm glad we're still talking about prep and that once it got approved here in BC, we didn't move on and hopefully getting approved in other places as well. Um, so, uh, this uh, uh, analysis was led by Zoe Greenwald, who was with uh, Lakshwal, um, and uh, she was unable to make it today, so uh, she asked me to present on her behalf. Um, so we have no conflicts of interest to declare. So just kind of uh, giving you some background, of course, naturally, uh, PrEP has come, become increasingly important in clinics. and and particularly clinics helping sexual minorities, have uh, increasingly been investing resources into uh, con consulting with people about their eligibility of PrEP, getting them connected to care, and then all of that post-prescription follow-up uh, that, that it relates to. And so when you think about this within context, uh, the context of kind of a syndemic framework, including things like mental health, uh, substance use, um, Identifying how to strategically deploy PrEP such as that it's a benefit to the people who need it most, I think is important to um, most of the community organizations that are spending a significant amount of their resources addressing these issues. And so identifying barriers to PrEP retention such as mental health issues, such as substance use and sort of things is, is really important. And so um, we've taken kind of a syndemic approach in considering that. Uh, but of course, it's uh, not always easy to get the information you want uh, from uh, clinical databases about complex issues uh, like mental health and substance use and that sort of thing. And so um, I think uh, really what we want to highlight with today's presentation is kind of that need to, um, to really think about PrEP not just in terms of an HIV prevention drug, but how it can be best strategically deployed to benefit all of us, not just those who traditionally already have access to healthcare services that they need. And so as what we did is we uh, worked with the Clinical Actual between 2011 and 2018. We used their kind of clinical database. And we basically asked the question, I assume that will fix itself, because uh, <laughs> I have no ability to. Um, So, okay, good. Uh, this is like, I, when I was doing my PhD defense, I was, you know, I have nervous tics and my button popped off on my top thing, so. <laughs> it takes me a while to get back on track, so, uh, after these sort of things. So, uh, anyways, we, uh, we were basically asking the question, just very simply, does something like distance uh, to care 
act as a barrier? Because I think increasingly in the sector we're recognizing that there's this divide between urban centers where certain services are tailored for um, at-risk populations, whereas in more rural areas, uh, a lot of the burden of responsibility is either placed on like university clinics or health department clinics. And so from a clinic focus, a, a clinic that is seeking out to improve the, the quality of life for uh, vulnerable populations, um, to understand what their role is in creating a, uh, a prep system delivery, delivery system um, was, was really what we were interested in kind of exploring. And so in addition to distance, we also looked at age and income, education, and then behavioral risk factors such as the number of sexual partners in the past 12 months, previous STIs, and uh, use of, of chemsex drugs. And so right in the downtown um, of Montreal's gay village uh, is, is kind of where Laxwell is, and um, they were you know, founded in 1984, so they've been uh, really well established in the community and uh, are interested in kind of um, addressing a holistic approach to people's health. And so uh, kind of the basic way that this data is collected is it's, uh, there's kind of a baseline enrollment when somebody contacts the clinic, and then they follow up uh, you know, after one month and after three month intervals. And that's largely what happens when you, you take PrEP because they want to do STI tests, check liver function, all those sort of things that the clinicians have recommended as being part of the kind of uh, PrEP follow-up. And so we wanted to look at, well, what are the factors that kind of um, achieve that successful uh, completion through the uh, PrEP cascade, or what are the factors that lead to uh, lost follow-up people leaving it? Um, and so, um, kind of with regards to results, you can kind of see the age distribution there uh, with a, a, a mean age somewhere around um, 30, 36, the median. Um, so about half of those people who initiated PREPs during the time period uh, retained PrEP. Um, and so overall, we got about 1,460 person years of observation. People uh, initiated both intermittent PrEP and, and daily PrEP. And so... Uh, here's some more just basic dis uh, descriptives. You see that, the, as you might expect, most of the participants were male, most of them were gay identified, uh, and their age groups uh, you know, wide var varied quite a bit. Um, educational attainment, you see a lot of educated people accessing PrEP. Uh, same with income, you see uh, that higher incomes tend to have more awareness possibly and th therefore accessing. Um, the majority of PrEP prescriptions were made on a daily basis. Um, and then you can also see that about half people used cannabis or poppers or chemsex drugs, and then uh, a smaller proportion used none or alcohol only. Um, so uh, thinking about that in terms of distance, you can see here on the screen kind of um, this, this takes back to people's uh, FSA code, which is those first three letters of a postal code and links it back to their centroid of, of residence. And so you can kind of see a lot of the services were kind of focused uh, there in the probably less than 20 uh, miles. Uh, but you can see across the full province of Quebec, you can see that there in the, in the corner up there, you can see that there's actually people who are traveling quite a distance to get access to services. So here's kind of the distribution uh, by distance you see about half w under five kilometers, about a quarter of uh, five to nine, and then about a quarter greater than uh, 10 kilometers. And so this is actually what the retention of care looks like. So the longer the line gets, the, uh, the longer it took for them to discontinue PrEP. And so you can see that that 20 to 49 kilometer or 50 kilometer, uh, they were much less likely, or they lasted longer essentially. Um, in looking at the independent and adjusted factors for this, you can see that uh, per kilometer distance, there was an increased uh, risk or hazard of, um, of people discontinuing PrEP, as was younger uh, age, whereas none of the other factors actually came out. And so I think this really speaks to thinking about a, a clinic's ability to address these issues. Um, we really need to start thinking about how our health system better integrates research and clinic data uh, so that we can really understand these epidemics a lot more. Um, because if all we're really able to say is that distance and age make a difference, I don't think that's enough to get at some of the fundamental issues. So one thing we looked at is, well, asking people why they, um, 
it will stop reason prep. So these people weren't lost to follow up. They were still able to be asked, um, what is the self-reported reasons? You can see things that ultimately we'd consider these reasons to stop prep would be kind of quote unquote good. You know, if you're uh, with a stable partner, you're no longer engaged in amount of risk. People seem to be fairly decent at uh, assessing, self-assessing their risk and knowing when uh, they need PrEP. But you can see that you know about 17% uh, stopped because of the cost, which is obviously prohibitive. Um, uh, this is based largely on like formulary restrictions, co-pays, and deductibles uh, can increase the cost of both uh, HIV drugs and uh, pre-exposure prophylaxis. Um, and then you can also see about 15% of people indicated that travel was their primary interest. And so that relationship between risk, which is I think if you're not in risk, then, right, then you don't necessarily have to be taking PrEP. Um, it's for those who feel like they're at risk or could use it for peace of mind or something like that. Um, but certainly these barriers, these structural barriers need to be better considered in how we're delivering care. Um, to people who live in, in rural areas, who live in uh, outside of that 10 kilometer range um, where, where PrEP access seems to be uh, the most easy. And so um, that's a, largely what I've talked about here in, in that. Uh, there are, of course, uh, limitations to the study. Uh, the measures of retention is using baseline data. Um, without adjustment for time varying confounders. And so certain things like education, uh, those sort of things can right, change, right? And so um, th this model was largely exploratory, didn't get into kind of all those potential mediators or, or confounders. Um, also, uh, considering the various ways we can measure distance, it's important. You saw we use like a per one kilometer. Uh, well, well, while that certainly uh, can be salient, just capturing that distance, I think also the culture in which people are embedded in, the types of cities they're living in, uh, whether or not they're in a rural or suburban or peri-urban uh, setting, I think all of those are other ways to try and capture distance. And so there's a lot of debate in the literature around how do we best characterize people's socio-ecological environment, as well as asking people about their socio-ecological environment, how they feel with regards to stigma, whether or not they feel comfortable having people know they're on PrEP, whether they think their friends would be accepting of it. All of those sort of things are embedded in that distance component, right? It's not just a factor of, well, I can't get transportation, though that is sometimes is. And so um, I think calling attention to that question of that socioecological force is important and bringing that into looking at PrEP, both PrEP access but also discontinuation <coughs> is important. And so um, I think we would like to thank all of the people who participate in Clinical Actual. Um, We've got five minutes, so that's good. Uh, so we're basically done, though. So, um, uh, and thank, obviously, the community partners and then those who, who run the clinic there. That's the end. Thank you.